So good evening and a very warm welcome to the talk this evening. Um, this is the eighth in a series of talks to accompany the Ben Ury's latest exhibition, Sheer Verb. Um, now we're going to address any questions you have at the end of the presentation. And if you could put your comments and questions in the Q&A rather than the chat box, that would be fantastic. Um, also, we may go a little over time this evening, as there is a lot to say. But if you have to go, remember there, there is a recording. Now, some of you may already know tonight's speakers, um, but for those of you who don't, um, Sarah McDougall is the creative director of collections, exhibitions and research at the Ben Uri. And she's also curator of the current exhibition called Sheer Verve, the Women's International Art Club, uh, 1898 to 1978. And her research interests focus on uh, artists of Jewish uh, refugee and immigrant origin. Uh, Rachel Dixon uh, is a former head of curator curatorial services at the Ben Uri, and she's now editorial consultant for Buru, which is the, uh, stands for the Ben Uri Research Unit. Uh, her research interests are emigre artists and designers. And she is very honoured at the moment to have written the biography accompanying a recent publication by the distinguished art historian Griselda Pollock on the emigre art historian Helen Rosenau and her 1944 pamphlet on women in art. And uh, over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Una, and many thanks for hosting us this evening. I'm really delighted to be here with my longtime colleague um, at Benary, Rachel, to talk about some of the women artists from the Benary collection who are featured in the current exhibition, Sheer Verve, which explores eight decades of the Women's International Art Club, as Una has mentioned, and which I'll refer to WIAC from now on for ease of reference. The artists have been grouped under the collective title Unsung this evening, since despite in many cases their rich exhibiting histories, artworks, lives and careers full of interest and resonance, the majority are largely unknown outside the Benary collection. And we hope to outline this evening something of their histories and their interactions with Benary and uh, in my part of the presentation with WIAC. And en route, we will also hope to uncover some of the reasons for their unsung status. For convenience, we have divided our talk into two parts, and I will begin um, with the earlier artists, and we'll each briefly discuss five artists as case studies. Before we get to the first, just a little bit of background. Um, the WIAC was founded in Paris in 1898, as an exhibition platform and a networking forum for women artists at a time of restricted opportunities amidst a male-dominated art establishment. The inaugural exhibition at London's Grafton Gallery in 1900 went on to become a fated annual event until the club was dissolved in 1978. During this period, the WIAC exhibited many artists of Jewish refugee and immigrant origin, and a number of those were also involved with Ben Uri, and many of them are on display in the current show. So Ben Uri had been founded in London's East End in 1915 as an art society for Jewish immigrant artists and craftsmen who were working outside the cultural mainstream. It began to actively collect from 1919, but had no gallery until 1925, and that was short-lived. The first exhibition there was 37 works strong, um, but it included no women artists, although you can see there were three women on the committee. The next exhibition in 1930 did feature two women, Jane Haas and Ida Simmons van Ralter, but their work has not been retained in the permanent collection. So between the estates comes my first case study, and this is the Polish emigre uh, textile designer and painter, Lina Pilico, 
Um, although notably, the first exhibition was not at the gallery, but was an at home at her studio in St John's Wood, which is local to the gallery today. Um, sadly, if there was a catalogue that hasn't survived, so we can't be sure exactly what she exhibited. But um, she was born Salomia Leah Goldman into a Jewish family in Wuj in the Kingdom of Poland, then in the Russian Empire. And uh, she came with her husband, Leopold Pilahowski, whose work we see on the left of the screen, to Paris um, in 1904. And he moved there for his career, and they spent a decade there before coming to England in 1914. And it was probably there that she first took on the uh, shortened version of her name, Madame Lena Pil Pilico, which is how she was predominantly known at the Women's International Art Club as well. So her husband was a well-known realist painter, predominantly of Jewish subjects. And um, her work, as we'll see, was actually very different. So he went on, after they moved to England, to become president of the Benary Art Society between 1926 and 32. And she is one, uh, and her exhibition, rather, um, obviously fell within those dates. So she's one of many women artists, both in the collection and in the exhibition, who had famous artist husbands. And one of the sub-themes of the show is how these relationships affected their careers, sometimes positively, sometimes adversely. The Pilahoskis had mainly independent, complementary careers, but after 1927, Lena did not show again with Ben until 1934, which was the year of her husband's death and her work entered the collection much later. In 1928, however, both husband and wife were among the 16 artists who exhibited work at the Brooklyn Museum in the US, and there she showed 29 paintings to his 17. So her first showing in England um, was barely a year after her arrival, in the midst of the First World War, the year of the founding of Benary, and it was almost certainly um, when she showed with the Wyack in that year. She used the name Madame Lena Pilico. However, the Wyack records, which have kindly been shared with me by Una, also variously list her as Pilachowski, Pelikowski, and Pilicho with an H, demonstrating one of the many ways that immigrant artists trails are obscured by frequent and common misspellings, anglicizations or transliterations of their names. Women who use both maiden and married names, sometimes as variants, further complicate this picture for researchers who are aiming to uncover their full exhibiting histories. And it's necessary to go down all those little winding trails to try and piece them together later on. So in 1915, at the Women's International Art Club, she showed four works, all with French titles, suggesting she bought them from Paris, and including one named Joie de Vivre. Sadly, their current whereabouts are unknown. In 1917, however, she showed a country house at the Women's International Art Club, and it's tempting to think it's this one. However, the alternative title is the much less grand outhouses, so perhaps that's just wishful thinking on my part. We know that she painted still lives, landscapes and portraits, but in the same year she also showed a number of other works, which included a set of eight small lampshades, a painted frame and design, an ornamental design and a painted cupboard. In 1921, she went on to show designs for stage and ornamental and decorative designs in 1923, a year in which she also served on the committee. She showed a design for stained glass. And in 1925, she showed a velvet screen. The whereabouts of most of this work is sadly unknown, but a portfolio of her bold textile designs for silk scarves. And she was really a pioneer in the use of silkscreen fabric 
for the creation of decorative silk squares, of which this work is one example, does survive. And this exemplifies the really exuberant decorative style which gained her frequent and positive critical attention in the 1920s and 30s. In the exhibition, this is the second work that you see, and it's been juxtaposed with a work by Sonia Delamy, who's a much more celebrated textile artist, of course. But this work does look incredibly modern, and people have really remarked on that. So in 1924, prior to her Benuri show, she also held another studio exhibition, which was described by the critic of the Times as seeming to represent the direct outpourings of the unconscious mind, controlled, however, by artistic taste and judgment and a much higher technical ability than is usual in such productions. The following year, she would show painted silks and velvets. These were exhibited in Bond Street, and they were admired for her extraordinary gift of colour and her profound, if indefinable, emotional quality. A 1931 exhibition at the Salon Club Gallery in Manchester also included wall hangings, tapestries and shawls, and that was admired for her versatility, love of colour, and free spontaneous design. So reviewing a further exhibition of her paintings on silk and velvet, the Times concluded a long review with the comment that Madame Pilico has a talent amounting to genius for this, this type of decoration. Lena Pilico was also one of the first women to exhibit with the Progressive Seven and Five Society between 1923 and 1927. And that, of course, was its most radical period under Ben Nicholson. And this second design, I'm sure, is typical of the work she would have shown there. Ten years on, however, in 1936, she had a solo exhibition of 57 recent paintings of her travels in Spain and Morocco. She's one of many artists from this period who really made pioneering travels. Um, and another pioneer was the English gallerist Lucy Bertheim, who showed these works at her gallery um, in 1936. And she later gifted three of them, including this one, to Salford Museum and Art Gallery. Third time was a champion of um, modernist painters, um, particularly Christopher Wood, a fellow Seven and Five member. So it's likely that Pilico's work came to her attention in this way, although perhaps surprising that she chose this slightly more traditional work to exhibit and purchase. Uh, last week in her lecture on women sculptors, Professor Fran Lloyd touched on the idea of legacy with 20th century women artists. And very often we can see that their work in public collections was found to have most commonly been bequeathed or given to those galleries, uh, public galleries, rather than being purchased outright. And Benuri's own works also fit this pattern. The provenance of that earlier outhouse is, is incomplete, but we know it was gifted. And the beautiful scarf designs are recent donations from the artist grandson for which we are very grateful. Moving to my second case, this is Lily Delissa Joseph, whose self-portrait with candles on display in Chirvo opens a portraiture section spanning um, almost six decades, but hers is the earliest in the exhibition. Um, I've redated it since the opening of the show. So originally I thought it was in the years of the Women's International Art Club showing, but we can actually now date it to 1895 due to a review in the Jewish Chronicle, which um, reviewed it at the Society of Portrait Painters exhibition in that year describing it as, quotes, a very strong piece of work for a lady, and adding that there is a suggestion of Lady Macbeth about the picture. This rather waspish comment is surprising, since it's clearly a portrait of Jewish observance, and the artist shows herself in modest dress with covered head, holding the two Shabbat candles, 
uh, which are traditionally kindled, of course, in um, observant households about 20 minutes before sundown to mark the formal beginning of the Sabbath. And yet, it's not at all a retiring portrait. And I've put up that picture, um, the self-portrait by Gwen John on the right. It's actually from the National Portrait Gallery and it's painted five years after this one, just to illustrate um, a similar point. In both portraits, the artists look out and engage uh, with us directly. So the work combines uh, Lily Delissa Joseph's interest in portraiture and in interiors, and it's very influenced by her admiration for Rembrandt, particularly in the use of light and shadow. It was subsequently much admired and shown at the Paris Salon in 1929, where it gained a silver medal, and then it was shown posthumously in an exhibition with her brother, Solomon J. Solomon, um, the RA, only the second Jewish RA, uh, in 1946, as we can see here. And it was then presented to the Benary collection afterwards by the artist's niece, Gertrude, who was the second Mrs. Redcliffe Salomon. So um, Leah, she was born, I should say, Leah Solomon into a Jewish family in Bermondsey and her mother was from a cultured artistic Viennese family. She trained at South Kensington Art School and the Ridley Hall, which is now the Royal College of Art. And she commenced her exhibiting career after marrying the architect, Delissa Joseph, who designed Hampstead Synagogue, among other buildings. And she used her married name professionally. She had her own studio in Bedford Row, which overlooked the Old Bailey, and this is almost certainly one of the views from it. The larger work was shown at the Royal Academy in 1937, and then presented by the trustees of the Chantry Bequest to the Tate. So this is the only one of her pictures to enter a public collection during her lifetime. And it shows her using a characteristically limited palette of white cobalt, rose madder and orange madder, um, the latter only made apparently by the firm of Newman, who later went out of business. Um, and those were the three colours or the idea of th using three colours had been pioneered by Sir Joshua Reynolds. So she was following in um, an art historical tradition. Uh, the one on the left is another iteration. She frequently recast her works in different iterations, but that one, the current whereabouts are unknown. And records show that Lily Delissa Joseph was a prolific exhibitor with progressive societies such as the New English Art Club in the 1880s and 90s, where she showed a work called Verve and in a mainstream context at the RA between 1905 and 38 also in Glasgow, in Liverpool, in Paris, and in a women's only context, both in a women's only exhibition at Earl's Court in 1900, and at the WIAC in 1902 and 1904, and her work was also shown there posthumously in 1963. And she also showed within a Jewish context at the Whitechapel Art Gallery and also at the Benary, but only once in her lifetime in 1934. So the confident self-portrait that we saw earlier also suggests someone who successfully managed to negotiate a number of identities, her Jewish artistically and politically radical identities. She was a pioneer in many fields. She was an early cyclist, an early wearer of bloomers, as they were then known, and one of the earliest women to own and drive a car. She voted by herself to Palestine in the 1920s, and when the car broke down, she sailed home. She also learned to fly aeroplanes when she was in her 50s, and she was deeply involved in the women's suffrage movement, famously unable to attend her own private view for her first solo exhibition of London and country interiors at the Bailey Gallery London in 1912, after she was detained at Holloway Jail. And you can see in the um, section on the left, which is from a press report again from the Jewish Chronicle, that her husband proudly um, proclaimed this in a notice beneath one um, about the exhibition. 
And I've lately been looking at her suffragette record, where interestingly she's listed as Mrs. Leah Joseph. And we can see also that her sister, Henrietta Lowy, and her niece, Gertrude, were also suffragettes and committed on similar charges. She was also a member um, of many charitable ventures, uh, including helping the young poet, Isaac Rosenberg, painter poet, I should say, whom she met at the National Gallery. And she got together with her sister Henrietta again and their friend, Mrs. Herbert Cohen, and the three of them sponsored his early studies at the Slade. So the work that we have on screen is one of her studies of the National Gallery. Uh, there are at least 12 known interiors of the gallery, possibly more. And I'm very grateful to the researcher, Isabel Moore, who helped me to identify and catalogue this one um, from the portrait that's hanging behind the easel you see there on the left, which can be identified as Mrs. Siddons by Sir Thomas Lawrence in the National Gallery's collection. So in 1924, she held a joint exhibition of work with her husband, and they each showed about 60 works. And this is really remarkable considering how few of Lily de Lissa Joseph works are in the public domain today. None of these works was for sale and most belong to family members. And in terms of legacy, that's perhaps one reason why more are not in the public sphere. Another is that she is known to frequently overpainted her pictures and it's been suggested that many were lost or even ruined in this way. So the final example of her work that I'm going to share with you is this one, which um, we can identify now as an interior within her light-filled summer house, North Sea Lodge at Birchington in Kent, which Delissa Joseph built around 1909 to 10. He also designed two studios for her brother Solomon, including one set on the cliff top, uh, which is still there, but ruined, very dramatic today. Uh, we do know that a work of a very similar title was shown at the WIAC um, later on and that it was lent by Ethel Solomon as it's listed there. Um, her name was actually Ethel Solomon and she was a chairwoman of Benury between 1943 and 66. But just as with her National Gallery interiors, um, Lily made many iterations of favoured subjects, so we can't be absolutely sure that this is the same one. Further work also needs to be done to identify the pictures on the wall in this one. I'm very intrigued by that large landscape of many female figures there. Um, it rather resembles a pre-Raphaelite painting, and we know that Rossetti lived in Birchington and was buried in the churchyard, but it's also been suggested that it may be suffragettes marching. Um, so I just wanted to mention in passing, Ruth Collett, whose maiden name was Salomon, and at some distant point, it's thought that the Salomon and Solomon families were actually related. Uh, her mother, Nina, was the first wife of the botanist Redcliffe Salomon, and she's depicted on the right here by Solomon J. Solomon, and the work is in the Jewish Museum. Um, Nina was also an active suffragette and moved in the same circles as Lydia Delissa Joseph, and she's also known as a very accomplished Hebrew scholar. After her early death, Ruth's father later remarried Lily's niece, Gertrude, who was the one who bequeathed the painting to the Benuri. So it's a very circular history. Ruth herself was an accomplished painter and printmaker who studied at the Slade and was associated prior to her marriage to the musician Robert Collett with the East London group. Afterwards, the couple lived for some years in Paris, where she studied with a printmaker, Stanley, Stanley William Hayter, at the famous Atelier 17. And after they returned to England, she also took lessons with New Zealand-born Kathleen Brown and her Polish émigré husband, Marion Kratochville. She was a prolific exhibitor at the Women's International Art Club, showing also with the London Group, the Royal Academy, the Society of Women Artists. She frequently showed work such as this one at the WIAC, 
And um, this is typical of her bold and painterly style. And she herself presented it to the Benary in 1950, the year she held a joint exhibition with Hitler emigres Adela Reifenberg and Lotte Reisenstein, whom Rachel will be talking about shortly. We move then to Amy Drucker, Amy Julia Drucker, who was born in Hampstead, uh, but to German Jewish emigre parents, uh, part of her history that's been really obscured until now when we can consult genealogy records, genealogical records to check these things. Her father, Carl, um, anglicized his name to Charles and became a prosperous wine merchant in London. Um, Amy trained in St John's Wood and at Lambeth School of Art, and she maintained a studio in Bloomsbury. She also studied sculpture at the Central School, and she befriended a younger artist, Claire Winston, who's also in the Benary collection. Um, Drucker's first major commission was from Queen Mary, and that was for an ivy miniature of the young Duke of Gloucester. Afterwards, she lived in Paris, studying there and exhibiting at the Paris Salon, and probably this work was made there. She exhibited also extensively in Britain and abroad, including at the Royal Academy, the Royal Hibernian Academy, the Whitechapel Art Gallery, Benuri Gallery, and with the Society of Women Artists, and just once with the Women's International Art Club. She became known for her portraits and genre scenes, uh, including atmospheric paintings of the First World War and of East End life. And afterwards, after the war, she traveled extensively in the Far East, South America, um, and uh, Abyssinia, then known as Ethiopia. And we'll see a work from that period in just a moment. Before that, however, this work is from the Benary collection, and you can see that this was again presented after her death in 1952, after a selling memorial exhibition, which was incredibly successful um, at the gallery. And this work sort of draws on earlier themes and pulls them together. She had been known for exhibiting um, a work known as The Aliens um, in an earlier exhibition at the Whitechapel. And that was probably a direct response to the Aliens Act of 1905, which had intended to stem um, the tide of Jewish immigration at source. And as I said, it's interesting to know that she herself has this um, immigrant background. Here, I think it's not so much an immigrant family, as a family who are victims of the economic slump, um, we can perhaps surmise that from the date of 1932. And she has taken the title from the Bible for he had great possessions, but used it here, I think, to imply that uh, the family of this probably out of work father are his great possessions. And we can see that they're loved and treasured in this portrait and intimations of those East End scenes that she was known for with the Barrow Boy in the background there. Um, so I touched on the fact that she traveled very extensively, including to the Far East, to South America. Um, we see here a picture from her time in Palestine in 1920. She also held solo exhibitions in Jerusalem, Shanghai, Peking, Buenos Aires, Lima and Panama, and taught Japanese color printing in what is now Kolkata in India and at the Jerusalem School of Art, as well as taking private pupils in London uh, and working during the Second World War as a factory hand and night watcher. Um, but she also traveled very extensively in Abyssinia. She spent um, a considerable time there and was commissioned to paint a life-size portrait of the emperor, Haile Sel Selassie. Um, I don't have that sadly, but we do have this wonderful portrait on the left of an Abyssinian woman with her baby. And this was exhibited um, at the Women's International Art Club in 1946. 
There is a wonderful uh, description of Amy Drucker in her memorial catalogue, describing her as having something of the gypsy, a lithe figure, olive skin, fine black hair, a humorous twinkle in her mysterious eyes. Her fashion in dress, we're told, was always her own, and many will remember the broad-rimmed black hat, the cloak designed for use as cape and travelling rug, and above all, the ubiquitous, many-coloured Mexican bag slung over the left shoulder and having holding everything from a pencil to a five pound note, a bunch of keys to a tin of sardines. So she died in 1951 and the memorial exhibition I mentioned was held at Benary Gallery the following year and a memorial prize was twice awarded in her name to promising young Jewish artists. Henry Sanders in 1952, Alfred Harris in 1954. And her work is actually in numerous public collections, um, not just in this country, but also abroad. And so we have to question why in her case, there's not um, a more widespread reputation. And that's perhaps because a lot of the works by these earlier artists which were very accomplished, but did not fall within the modernist canon, um, have simply become unfashionable uh, in today's uh, way of considering legacies and careers. So my penultimate case study is Clara Klinghoffer, whose work on, uh, who can be seen on the screen. And she was the first woman artist um, to have a work enter the Benary collection in 1935, and we'll see that work shortly. She was born in Polish Galicia in 1900 and came over to England with her family, aged three, settling first in Manchester and then moving to London's East End, the heart of the Jewish quarter, where her father was a tailor. She drew from a young age and frequently depicted local subjects, um, such as this man, and also her six sisters were very frequently uh, in her work. She um, showed, she um, trained rather at the Central School, uh, where Bernard Meninsky famously declared that she, that she drew like Leonardo da Vinci. And she quickly established a reputation as the new girl genius, gaining a bursary to study at the Slade under Professor Henry Tonks and holding her first exhibition while still a student in 1920. Of course, that kind of label is a very difficult one to uh, have as an adult. But she had further solo exhibitions at prestigious London galleries, um, six of them, throughout the 1920s and 30s at galleries, including the Leicester and Redfern galleries. And she also showed with the Goupil Gallery salons, particularly showing drawings of women and children, often based on her sisters. And these were frequently likened in the press to the work of Raphael. But she also showed in progressive societies, the New English Art Club, the London Group, Mainstream with the Royal Academy, the Carnegie International, and in exhibitions of Jewish art, although she was said to dislike this label. Um, she also showed, of course, at the Women's International Art Club. And the work that we have in the exhibition is um, seen here on the uh, screen. And this is a work which shows the Indian artist Pratima Devi, who was daughter-in-law to the famous poet Rabindranath Tagore, you can see them on the right hand side. And her sister Sunayani Devi was also a very talented painter and she was one of six Indian artists who showed at the Women's International Art Club. Um, so Klinghoffer was said by one critic to have a soft focus to her portraits, but what an inner life. And I think that's really revealed in this portrait of Pratima Devi. Some of the other works that she showed at the Women's International Art Club include this one of the old troubadour from 1926, which was carried out on her honeymoon. Um, in 1926, she married a Dutchman called Joop Stoppelman, and after um, moving together to Paris and her then having a successful show in Amsterdam, they moved together 
um, to Holland until they were later forced to flee to New York uh, during the Second World War and making that her fourth journey as an immigrant. Um, another of her well-known portraits is this one of Lucien Pizarro, um, the famous printmaker and son of Camille Pizarro. And this was exhibited uh, at the Women's International Art Club. She also did a portrait of his daughter, um, Oravida, and we see that here with Oravida in her later years. The two women were close friends, and the kind of objects that are depicted in the background, particularly the cat, are sort of typical of the kind of subjects that Oravida was interested to. So that leads us on to Oravida, um, as she preferred to be known, and she's my final subject tonight. She was born in 1893, a member of the distinguished Pizarro painting dynasty, and the only daughter of the landscape painter and printmaker Lucien Pizarro, who we just saw on screen. Her mother, Esther, was also a wood engraver and designer, and of course, her grandfather was the famous Impressionist painter Camille Pizarro. She too began drawing and painting at an early age and was the first woman uh, in the family to become a professional artist. She was a frequent WIAC exhibitor for more than 30 years and sat on the executive and hanging committees um, and was one of the women who suggested they might invite men to exhibit. She first learned to paint from her father, uh, but rejected Impressionism and briefly studied with Walter Sickert before rejecting that too to develop her own style. This is the work we have on show um, at the gallery and it's a really fantastic work, very large in scale and has huge impact. And she showed this three times at the Women's International Art Club. So it was clearly very important to her. Prior to this, she'd held a solo exhibition of etchings and drawings at the Adelphi Gallery in 1919, and a joint exhibition with the French artist Marie Laurencin, who's also included in Sheer Verve, uh, in 1921. But Oravida always was outside mainstream British art movements. She was greatly influenced by an exhibition of Chinese and Japanese art that she saw at the British Museum in 1924. And she developed a very personal style, combining elements um, from these cultures, also looking closely at Persian, Indian and African art. And um, this is an example of her etching style, but she was also encouraged to look at these uh, non-European art forms by her friend Dora Clark, a fellow exhibitor uh, in the Women's International Art Club. She painted usually in tempera in these early years between 1919 and 39 to her own recipe, which she called body color. And you can see that ornate calligraphic signature as well on the left. Many of her works are also surrounded by a silk brocade border, which makes them incredibly decorative. Um, she wrote to her parents in 1925 that the Wyack was treating her as a celebrity and her oil painting there had been given a place of honour. And critics also noted uh, that she was working in this Chinese style, as it was termed. So she also held um, solo shows, um, a number of those, including at the Redfern Gallery, also showed at Benary Gallery quite frequently and exhibited at the RA between 1917 and 67. She depicted animals very often, both domestic and exotic, often observing them at London Zoo, um, and also a lot of hunting scenes. There's a rather disturbing title, The Monkey Killer, to this beautiful leopard on the right. During the Second World War, uh, she took up oil painting, um, and this was really due to a deficiency of eggs and hence uh, her inability to do tempera works. And as she embraced oils, her style really changed. Um, so in the wake of the widespread displacement of the war, she began to focus on close dis groups of individuals, 
carrying out everyday tasks and displaying a strong sense of humanity. And this painting, Refugees, which was exhibited at the WIAC in 1950, also at the Benary in 1951, and at the Redfern Gallery in 1952, was purchased for the collection last year. And it was created in 1947, which was the year um, in which many stateless people and refugees gained British citizenship and also marked the beginnings of a new multicultural community. Oravida's work um, is in many collections. Uh, her etchings are in the British Museum and the Ashmolean Museum, which also um, preserves the legacy of her parents. But perhaps her reputation has just been overshadowed by her very famous father and grandfather, and like many of these women, is really ripe for serious reassessment. So that seems a good place for me to conclude and to hand over now to Rachel. Okay, I'm going to hopefully share my screen. Can you all hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah, for that fascinating um, introduction to our unsung cohort. And I'm now going to continue the theme um, with very brief case studies, because I've actually got six Hitler emigres um, to get through. Now, for this cohort, with one exception, their works have all come into the Benary collection due to personal, personal connections. And it's this personal, often familial dimension which brings such richness to these individual stories. These women are no longer dry, dusty, forgotten figures of art history. So I'm going to start with German Jewish sculptor Elsa Frankel. Born in 1892 in Bernsheim into a prosperous Jewish family, she grew up in Heidelberg where she initially studied art, uh, furthering her studies in Brussels and in Karlsruhe. In 1918, following marriage to lawyer Georg Frenkel, she moved to Hanover until 1933, the year of her divorce, of Hitler's appointment as chancellor and the imposition of anti-Semitic laws. In Hanover, Moving in creative and intellectual circles, she began her career as a portrait sculptor and began to mix with renowned Dadaist Kirch fitters, joining a group of artistic women who, quote, could be self-reliant, financially independent and politically active without having to conform to the cliche of the trouser-clad new woman with her short hair and cigarette. Frankel's closeness with Schwitters is affirmed by the Merz collage Für Frau Frankel, he gifted to her and now in the Benary collection, acquired from her family, with the word Paris clearly visible. And Frankel's narrative has gained particular traction through family efforts as conduits to her archive and key figures in revitalizing her legacy through a dedicated website and other activities. So you can see how family members are so important in um, maintaining an interest in these artists' lives. So this archive photograph shows her as a young sculptor in her Paris studio, designed for her in the 1930s when she worked between Germany and France, studying under Jacques Lushansky, visiting the ancient collections in the Louvre and moving in artistic circles. She sculpted interesting faces and declined boring commissions. Her subjects included Minna Tobler, the Swiss pianist and mistress of sociologist Max Weber, the granddaughter of the French poet Mallarmé, and the painter Marcel de Roule. Dated 1935, this bronze must have been a final work cast in France, brought to England, and then presented by the artist to Tate in 1952. When Elsa fled Germany in 1993, wisely bringing many of her works with her, she left behind a growing reputation, having already shown with Berlin's Flechtheim Gallery. Arriving in London in 35, despite a professed lack of confidence, 
Frankel made swift advances into the art world. By June, she was studying sculpture at the Central School, while correspondence with Sir William Rosenstein, the recently retired principal of the Royal College of Art, suggests a warm relationship, Frankel sitting to him at least once. In July, she showed in a refugee exhibition at the Belgravia home of Mrs. Ernest Schiff, her mathematician praised by the Jewish Chronicle as, quote, a head of exceptional interest, modelled with perfect control, end quote. In 1936, she showed Young Chinaman in the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. That's the piece that's um, in sheer verve and now belongs to Ben Uri. She also had a small display at the Leicester Galleries and was one of the first women sculptors to show with Ben Uri, displaying her bronze mask in the annual exhibition. Although records are scanned, Frankel clearly established a rapport with Ben Uri, as the art committee in the July commissioned a portrait from her of Sir Moses Gaster, head of the Sephardi community. However, payment took a decade to be made. In 1937, Frankel showed young Chinaman at the WIAC under the presidency of her new friend Ethel Walker before gifting the work to Leighton House via her connection to Sir Alfred Rice Oxley, the mayor of Kensington, and from where it has passed into the Benary collection in 2018. Further professional links, as evidenced by her sitters, included the Bond Street gallerist, Sidney Sabin, here his head is being sculpted, and fellow emigre, Indian art expert and court old lecturer, Dr. Stella Cramrish. Establishing a studio home in St. John's Wood in 1938, when her daughter and mother arrived from Germany, Elsa was initially supported by remittances from her parents' business. Subsequently, due to her son's important war work in the Essex factory, working on the mosquito fighter bomber, mother and son were exempt from internment. Frankel relocated to Loughton, Essex during the Blitz, later serving as honorary vice president for the Essex Art Club. In May 1940, she featured in a group show of sculpture and drawing at the British Arts Centre at the Stafford Gallery, alongside sculptors including Epstein, Hepworth, Skeeping and Hermes, and fellow emigre Dora Gordeen, with whom she shared an interest in the non-Western, though they were not friends. In Ben Uri's opening exhibition in Portland Street in January 1944, she showed her portrait of Minna Tobler, entitled The Musician Here. Later in the war, in a bizarre turn of events, Frankel suffered identity theft when a German spy adopted her name, but she resumed her career post-war, taking on an English surname in 1946, plucked at random from a phone directory, becoming Elizabeth Dane in daily life, prompted by her daughter, who wished to join the army of occupation in Europe and where she did not want a German name. And as Sarah has already mentioned, it's worth noting that name changes affected women emigres perhaps more than their male counterparts, often making tracing their careers more difficult. As well as gaining and losing names of fathers and or husbands, they might have multiple identities. Elsa Rothschild becomes Elsa Frankel, becomes Elizabeth Dane. Names can also appear tantalizingly ungendered in catalogues which give only a first initial and where the tendency is often to assume the work is by a male artist. In August 47, the emigre art historian Helen Rosenau wrote in the newly founded AJR information, I quote, the plastic arts neglected by Jews for generations for traditional reasons now stake a claim of resurgent force and women contribute powerfully to this monumental form of expression, end quote. And she then singled out Frankel amongst a small German cohort. Frankel also connected, reconnected with Schwitters at this time now in exile in the north of England. Writing and inviting him to visit, she recalled bringing, quote, nine paintings of yours with me. One of them is in my studio. Frankel was naturalized in the same year. and the following year, she showed in Modern Masters and Artists of Today at 20 Brook Street. Morley College for Adult Education Archives confirm her as a temporary course teacher for portrait drawing and sculpture for the session 1940 to 50, sorry, 49 to 50. But eventually in failing health, Frankel moved to India 
to live with her daughter, leaving the bulk of her art and archive with her son in Britain. Despite her works in Tate and Ben Uri, her fellowship of the Royal Society of Arts, her honorary membership of the Council of the Royal Society for India, Pakistan and Ceylon, and her later portraits of prestigious non-Western figures, including Queen Sirikit of Thailand, Pandit Nehru, and with reference to Sarah's uh, earlier mentions of Ethiopia, Princess Tsehai, daughter of Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. And despite connections with feminist and social activist Sylvia Pankhurst, Frankel remains little known in England. Nevertheless, her family continued to work towards her rehabilitation, both here and in Germany. And Una Richmond's new research on her presence at WIAC makes an interesting addition to these efforts. My second heroine is connected with Frankel, the German Jewish sculptor Erna Nonnenmacher. In July 47, Benuri opened painting by Walter Trier and sculptor by Erna Frankel and uh, sorry, Elsa Frankel and Erna Nonnenmacher, continuing its support for women artists and today they make up 29% of the permanent collection. Born in Berlin in 1889, Erna trained at the progressive, liberal and Jewish-owned Heimann Schule, the Kunstgewerbe Schule, and at the Technical School for Ceramics in Brunslau, before marriage to fellow sculptor Hermann Nonnemacher in 1919. Erna then was employed by the renowned Rosenthal porcelain factory and at Fraureuth, while Hermann made large-scale public sculptures, many of which the Nazis destroyed as degenerate. Both shared the former studio of Bauhausler Lionel Feinecker in Potsdam until February 38, when they fled to England. From her first mention in the British press, Erna's trajectory in exile was almost always yoked to her Gentile husband. They were interned at the same time, taught together post-war, and frequently showed together with consecutive exhibits at the 1939 first group exhibition of German, Austrian and Czechoslovakian painters and sculptors held at the aforementioned Wertheim Gallery and then even at Ben Uri, although Hermann was non-Jewish. Unlike Frankel, Erna was interned. Held in Holloway prior to transfer to the Isle of Man, she was sent to Russian women's camp. In September 1940, the Jewish Chronicle article 40 artists interned, noted that alongside Johnny Hartfield, Martin Bloch and Ludwig Meidner, Mr. and Mrs. Nonna Marker were, quote, languishing behind barbed wire. While many male internees continued to make art and exhibit in camp, women were encouraged into handicrafts and educational occupational pursuits. Hence, Erna's legacy from, Ru from Russian is tiny, a single tile made from local clay its design inspired by the calf of man's stone. However, due to administrative quirk, women's camp records are more complete than the men. Thus, we can see Erna's registration card with her photograph, recording that she left the island on the 14th of February, 1941. Following their release, the couple participated in the 1941 AIA and FGLC exhibition of sculpture and drawing. In the catalogue forward, Herbert Reed noted that these emigre artists, quote, have been uprooted, deprived of their studios, their materials, their very tools. They work tentatively with great difficulty without adequate economic support in their exile. But even so, they represent a tradition of which in, we in England know too little. At this time, many emigres were sustained by a network of German fellow speaking, sorry, of fellow German speaking refugees the daughter of Charles Lahr, the emigre owner of the progressive bookshop in Hoburn, recalled, I quote, Occasionally we visit Hermann Nonnemacher and his wife. The ground floor of their archway house forms one large studio in which stand figures emerging from the stone and those struggled out, set in one position as if frozen. They are childless and the stone people to which their hands give birth are more to them than flesh and blood. A wonderful photograph from the archive of emigre sculptor Inga King, who was apprenticed to Herman, shows the couple atop a horse-drawn cart laden with sculptures moving to their new studio home in Archway. And the head of a woman in the middle of the cart is actually also in the Benori collection now. 
In October 45, weeks after the war ended, the couple exhibited in sculpture in the home at Heels Mansard Gallery, again under the auspices of the AIA. Sculpture was shown progressively in, quote, an intimate setting of furniture and textiles, rather than the more conventional atmosphere of the ordinary gallery, end quote. Several women participated and domestic familial themes were popular. Erna showed young mother. From 1949 to 70, Herman taught modeling and pottery at Morley College, where Erna is officially listed as working with him only from 62 to 69, though archive notes su suggest she was his assistant from the outset. Herman's salary in 1951 was nine pounds, three shillings and four pence. Erna's not recorded, though she may have, rec have worked gratis. Photographs show the Queen Mother visiting their class in 1958, proudly received by the couple smartly dressed for the occasion. Both exhibited in the inaugural show at Morley Gallery in 1969. However, aside from this rare progressive moment, Erna is mainly recorded in the Jewish press, her tender feminine works featuring regularly in Benary's open annuals until the early 1960s, often paired with Frankel in the sculpture section. The couple showed regularly at the RA, and in 1953, they held a joint show in their archway studio. Alphonse Rosenberg, reviewing a Ben Uri show for the AJR in September 66, praised Erna, quote, her many years teaching activities have established her as a respected and well-loved personality amongst art students of all ages, describing her work as distinguished in its extreme simplicity. However, a review of the opening speech at Herman's 1973 retrospective provides a telling coda. The speaker, quote, hoped that one day there might be an exhibition of works by Mrs. Nonamaka, a distinguished artist in her own right. The couple's membership of the Royal Society of British Sculptors highlights this inequality. Erna was nominated in 1964, age 75, while Herman had been elected a decade earlier with subsequent elevation to a fellowship. Erna's last exhibition in 1978 was also alongside Herman at the Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany, marking the opening of the new London Chancery. And of course, posthumously, it is wonderful to have her newly restored maternity on display in sheer verve. I'll turn next to Elsa Meidner, half of another artistic couple, wife of the great Jewish expressionist mystic painter Ludwig Meidner. Born into a wealthy Jewish family in 1901 in Berlin, Elsa was encouraged in her art from a young age by Max Slevot and Katie Kollwitz. She studied at the Kunstgewerbeschule and the Academy and took drawing classes with Ludwig, whom she married in 1927. Although her first solo show at the Jury Fry in 1932 was critically received, the following year following anti-Semitic legislation, the couple could only show to a Jewish audience. Mounting anti-Semitism forced their move to Cologne, where Ludwig taught at a Jewish school, prior to immigrating to England in 1939 with their son David. The couple initially settled in Camden Town, with Elsa working as a domestic, often the only way emigre women could obtain visas. Following mass internment in 1940, Ludwig was sent to Hutchinson Camp on the Isle of Man, the so-called artist camp, an experience which he found surprisingly positive, with kosher food, stimulating company, and the means to draw. Post-war in 1947, the couple moved to a tiny flat on the Finchley Road, where they lived in cramped conditions surrounded by thousands of Ludwig's works, enduring great poverty and struggling to achieve critical recognition from the British art establishment. Their joint exhibition at Benary in autumn 1949, Ludwig's only show in 12 years of exile, passed largely unnoticed by the wider public and Ludwig likened it to a second class funeral. In early summer 1953, the emigre art historian and critic J.P. Hoden Living nearby in Hampstead and pioneer of what he termed the Continental British School of Painters, visited the Meidners at home. As Elsa's subsequent patron, he made a detailed case study of her for over 30 years, publishing a profile in the studio and a monograph in German in 1979. 
Hodin understood the complex dynamic existing between the couple. I quote, jealousy and competing ambition played an important part in their lives. Nevertheless, a deep and mutual affection bound them together. Despite Hodin's support, Elsa could not overcome the disappointment and bitterness of losing her homeland and recalled, quote, here in London, I walk about as in a dream and am surprised I'm here. Some plants thrive wherever you transplant them, but I could never put down new roots. My roots are in Berlin, end quote. The couple became increasingly estranged. And when Ludwig returned to Darmstadt to critical acclaim in 1953, the year Elsa became a British citizen, she remained in London. Elsa herself exhibited mainly in London galleries with emigre links, showing charcoals at the Matesian Gallery in 56 and at the Beaux-Arts in 59. Benuri held two retrospectives for her in 1964 and then in 1972, a delayed 70th birthday show. Hodin opened both and wrote the catalogue text for the latter. Elsa's drawings of nudes, portraits and mother and child groups suggest the influence of Rembrandt, both in the expression of the inner life of his sitters and in her subtle and dramatic chiaroscuro. Her later, more colourful expressionist painting, such as this work in the Benary collection and on show in Sheer Verve, was equally imbued with deep emotion. Elsa died in London in May 1987, having bequeathed her entire oeuvre to Hodin, who persuaded the Tate grudgingly in 1983 to accept one work, her disturbing charcoal self-portrait Death and the Maiden, as a token of the artist's gratitude for having spent the years of emigration in England. In 1989, Hoden denoted portrait of a bearded man himself to Ben Uri. A joint retrospective of the Meidners was held at Ben Uri in 2002 in conjunction with the Jewish Museum Frankfurt. And earlier this year, I spoke about the relationship between Elsa and Hoden as revealed by his papers in the Tate archives. Now I will turn to the aforementioned Lottie Reisenstein, artist, designer, and art teacher, and represented in sheer verve by the still life. Thinly painted, its precise structure and composition suggests a designer's careful eye. Her career in exile has largely been overshadowed by that of her younger composer brother Franz, with exhibitions mostly limited to Jewish contexts. However, just recently, her nephew John has come forward after visiting Sheer Verve, ensuring that once again a personal connection has been made. And we now have our first photograph of Lottie and know that one of her landscapes is on permanent display at the Royal Academy of Music, where Franz taught. Lottie was born in Nuremberg in 1904 to an assimilated Jewish family with an appreciation of the arts. Her father, a physician, was a keen painter and a keen collector. Despite this, her parents were reluctant to allow her to pursue painting as a career. Consequently, she trained as a teacher from 1923 to nine while studying arts and crafts part-time at the local Kunstgewerbe Schule. In 1931, she began studying at the aforementioned Reimann Schule for two years before obtaining a visa and following France to London in 1936, where she studied at St. Martin's and the Central School until her widowed mother joined her in 1939. During the war, she did factory work, was a freelance artist, and took a teacher training course at Loughborough College of Arts and Crafts. She became a naturalised British citizen in 1948 and gradually turned her attention to design. And her nephew John has just shown us for the first time one of her wonderful designs. And at this time, she began to focus on fashion and embroidery. She exhibited regularly with Ben Uri from 1946, the year she showed with the WIAC, including with a studio group in 1952, and then in 1956, on both occasions alongside a number of fellow emigres, exemplifying Ben Uri's role as an unofficial refugee network in which women played an equal part. She furthered her art training with Kokoschka at the Salzburg Summer Academy in 1954, and at the Royal Drawing Society in 1956 in London. Traveling extensively, like Amy Drucker, her colorful scenes in oils, watercolors, and gouache were the focus of many of her late studio exhibitions and her solo show at Benary in 1959. And we have a similar view here 
of Arab women here um, doing their laundry. She worked as an art tutor for London and Middlesex County Councils, then latterly for the Marlebone Institute until 1974. She also gave private art lessons in her Hampstead studio. Her last solo show was 1976 locally at the Margaret Fisher Gallery in Hampstead, although she featured in the aforementioned German artists in London show at the embassy. After her death in 1982, Ben held two memorial shows. And Reisenstein's modest professional trajectory in exile is typical of many emigre women who suffered the triple whammy of being female, Jewish and refugees, and who hence often found Benary to be their main exhibition outlet, but by dint of its Jewish profile, inevitably limiting. Lottie's career leaves few traces today, mostly exhibition notices and reviews in the Jewish press. But unlike many of her emigre peers, Reisenstein was an optimistic artist. Writing for the AJR in April 68, Alphonse Rosenberg touchingly observed, and quote, her works affirm the victory of light, form, and order and color over darkness, destruction, anarchy, and gray despair. Quote. Going forward, we hope the renewed family connection will lead to further research, particularly regarding her design career, and to further exposure. Now I'll close with two polls. The first is Helena Korn. And her work was acquired in 2019, again via very personal collect connections, via Maria Zuawski, the widow of Polish painter printmaker Marek Zuawski, who was previously married to Korn. And coincidentally, so Zuawski's former studio home, previously the studio of Victorian sculptor Gilbert, Days, Gilbert Bays, is just down the road from Ben Uri in Gravel Place. Maria still lives there, surrounded by works by her late husband, and by Helena, his second wife, both featured in Benary's 2017 survey show, Art Out of the Bloodlands, a century of Polish artists in Britain. Helena was born into a large Jewish family in Warsaw in 1902. During the 1920s, she studied journalism while also taking singing lessons at the Warsaw Con Conservatory. She first met Zuawski in 1938, but in the uncertain early part of the war, Zuawski returned to London where he had lived since 37, while Korn left for Paris. After working for the Polish government in exile, she escaped on a boat bound for America after the Nazi occupation of France in 1940, arriving instead at Falmouth in Cornwall. As historian Philip Van writes, quote, she realized she was in Britain only when on disembarking, a woman asked if she wanted a cup of tea, end quote. Contacting Zuawski from a nearby refugee camp, he secured her a job at the Polish Embassy in London. Largely self-taught, Korn began painting and sculpting at home. Her husband, recognising her innate talent, offered two pieces of advice. Quote, keep your brushes clean and do not try to paint like somebody else. End quote. In 1942, she exhibited her first works at the WIAC, Working for the embassy until 46, she had little time to pursue her art and her creativity was further curtailed when in the same year, she learned that her entire family had perished in the Holocaust, triggering a nervous breakdown and her first hospitalization. Subsequently diagnosed as bipolar, Korn was in and out of psychiatric clinics for the rest of her life. Gradually post-war, however, Korn resumed sculpting and painting. Without formal training, she relied on both professional and emotional support from Zuawski, whom she had married in 1948. The same year, she held her first solo show, Paintings of London Life, at the Mayer Gallery. She participated in Artists of Fame and of Promise at the Leicester Galleries and with the Royal Society of British Artists. In 1950, she spent time in Paris trying unsuccessfully to organise her own show. She took inspiration from the mundanity of daily life, finding subjects, quote, everywhere and in human beings, not humanity. Seeing beauty in crowds at a lion's corner house, while, quote, the landscape of Kilburn High Road gives me the same kick as the most picturesque Italian site. Often described as naive, Korn's works, never drawn on the spot but recalled from memory, were nevertheless sophisticated in their use of composition and colour, 
and through them she declared a sense of artistic independence, resolutely signing corn even after her marriage. In the early 50s, she worked for the BBC's Round the Galleries broadcast. She also exhibited with the London Group and with Ben Uri, both in 1951, with the Beaux-Arts in 53, and in Polish painters in Britain in 1955, at the Crane Gallery in Manchester, founded by Hungarian emigre Andras Kalman. In 1958, at the Gabor Bokas Common Room in Maida Vale, a club for writers, artists and scientists, run by Polish emigres Stefan and Franziska Temesny, Korn read from the English version of her childhood autobiography, Holidays End in September, which she unsuccessfully attempted to publish. She exhibited in the Arts Council Sculpture in the Home Show in Edinburgh in 1959, was mentioned a new British artist in the studio the following year, and held a solo show at Edinburgh's Traverse Theatre in 64. The year after, following another bout of depression, Korn underwent brain surgery. As a result, she stopped sculpting and painting for a time, resigning from the WIAC in 1967, the year in which she completed her last paintings. In September 74, she suffered a serious heart attack. Helena Korn died in London in October 1978. Posthumously, her work was shown at the Camden Arts Centre in 1981. Her childhood memoir was published in Warsaw in 1983, and she now occupies a significant place within the emigre collections and archives at the University of Turin in Poland, and we hope to revive her reputation here in London going forward. My final unsung Polish heroine is Janina Baranowska, who was born into a Catholic family in Grodno in 1925. Her work on show in Sheerwerf, Actium Devoured by His Hands, was presented by Monica Bobinska from her parents' collection in 2018, another very personal connection. And I met Baranowska the previous year at her South London home with its crammed upstairs studio when I featured her in Art Out of the Bloodlands. As a young woman, she was deported in 1940 with her mother to Kazakhstan after the Soviet invasion of Poland. In 1942, following a pact between the Polish government in exile and Stalin, and having lied about her age, she joined the Polish Anders Army under General Anders, comprising the Polish forces in the East and many refugee civilians to begin the arduous trek back to Europe via Italy in the Middle East. Her mother died during the journey. Baranowska's wartime experiences inspired later artworks, while her deep Polish Catholicism often informed her religious subjects. Baranowska eventually arrived in Britain in 1945, first settling in Edinburgh, before moving to London the following year, studying under David Bomberg at Borough Polytechnic from 1947 to 1950. As Bomberg's youngest and she alleged favourite pupil, he taught her the importance of form and composition, encouraging his students to turn their works upside down to free them from the constraints of visual reality. Actian typifies her earlier looser expressionist work with its rich impasto and deep tones, but from the 1970s this emotional work gave way to lighter colours in a tighter format with a strict geometric grid often providing an underlying compositional framework. Baranowska also studied ceramics and graphics at Putney School of Art, thus broadening her practice. In 1979, she won a competition held by the Union of Polish Airmen to design stained glass windows in St. Andrew Bobola, the center of commem commemoration for London's Polish Catholic community and the church in which General Anders' funeral mass was celebrated in 1979 and indeed Baranowska's own last year. The three lancet windows in the north transept memorialise Polish airmen who so distinguished themselves in the Battle of Britain, integrating the form of the cross with two swooping airplane trails. Whereas my previous heroines showed often within a Jewish context, Baranowska inevitably tended to exhibit in galleries run by Polish emigres, such as the Drian, founded by Helene Manavec, and the Grabowski. She also exhibited with the Association of Polish Artists in Great Britain, becoming chairman in 1980 and president from 81 to 91, with the Polish Cultural Institute in 1993 
and at POSC, the Polish Social and Cultural Centre in Hammersmith, which held a retrospective in 2015. She was also associated with Polish artists in exile, including former Anders Army veteran Marian Bohusiszku, founder of the eponymous School of Painting, and as a lone woman in Group 49, a post-war collective of Polish painters. From 1965 to 2007, she was director of the POSC Gallery, organizing exhibitions and helping artists from Poland and elsewhere in accordance with its mission to, quote, promote and encourage access to Polish culture in all its forms to Poles and non-Poles, end quote. And she was also an active member of the WIAC, showing from the 1950s to the 70s and serving on the committee in 1968 and in 69. In 2014, her work featured in pole position, Polish art in Britain at the Graves in Sheffield. And in 2017, as I mentioned, she featured in Art Out of the Bloodlands. Janina Baranowska died on the 1st of October, 2022, more exactly a year ago. So it's with great pleasure to see her, her collection work posthumously shown in sheer verve and to see a Polish Catholic artist extend Benary's focus on its unsung heroines. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel and Sarah. Uh, although we seem to have lost Sarah. Oh no, here's Sarah. <laughs> Hello. Um, now at the moment, we don't seem to have any questions coming up. Um, but if we've still got time, um, I wonder if, could I ask you a question um, from some of these amazing unsung women? So it seems that there was a lot of women showed uh, with Ben Yuri. It was much more egalitarian. They had opportunities with Ben Yuri. They were on the committees, um, you know, the chair and and now the collection has about 29% of women artists in the collection, which is quite incredible. And I just wonder if you could reflect on maybe why that is. Who do you want to go? So I think it's partly because of when it was formed. It was formed in the 20th century. So women were already, um, you know, having opportunities to go to art school they were exhibiting all, all these galleries as we've heard and also because um it was a jewish organization which was founded by and for immigrants um they were very active and supportive within that so even at the mm. first when they weren't exhibiting immediately they were um on the committee and um also um I really touch on that, but um, a lot of the committee members themselves also supported artists and particularly Ethel Solomon, whose name came up a number of times there. Um, she was a great supporter, particularly of the women artists, and she enabled a number of their works to enter the collection. Um, so that was really important. And I, I think they just... Um, were able to be influenced by also these kind of three waves of migration, which we shorthand to say make up the Benary collection. So the first, the Eastern European founders, the Hitler emigres that Rachel spoke so much about, and then the post-war migration um, of multicultural, multi-ethnic um, communities. But women um, therefore, were working within that century where it was accepted for them to be part of all these activities. But I, I don't know if Rachel wants to yeah. add. I mean, just uh, picking up partly on the Ethel Solomon point, because actually one of the images that I cut when I was told I was going to have much less time um, was the portrait of Ethel Solomon's daughter, Shirley, which was made by Elsa Frankel and um, then gifted uh, to Benary. So Ethel, not only this indefatigable woman in so many roles, she was on the art committee, she was vice president, she was president, she was trustee, and she was there for an inordinately lengthy period of time. And you can see from some of the images we show where she was gifting works. Then also there was a, a couple who were very involved with Benary in the 80s, 
and I guess into the early 90s, and that's Alice and Walter Schwab, but particularly Alice. Um, and again, I think you have this female empathy and also Sadie Buchler um, was a curator and secretary. There's a sort of blurring in this position when you're curator, secretary, what exactly did that mean? You generally kind of did everything. Um, so that's another woman um, who had a prominent role. And I think it's probably very timely for research to be done to look at these number of women who have threaded their way through Ben Uri's history. And then of course, more recently, Aggie Katz. Um, well, of course, um, I should just interrupt Rachel because I see Emily Fuggle is with us, who is our PhD student, who is indeed researching all these women. Um, oh, right, right, yes. The so, uh, adding much light on we, the subject. I'm really interested to know about Sadie Buchler. Um, yeah. So, yes, a very egalitarian atmosphere, um, providing a platform for these women non judgmentally. Mm -hmm. And women helping other women. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, and do we have time for another question, do you think? Probably squeeze in um, one more since our audience have been very patient. Though. Yes. We are, okay. we are losing a few to their supper, I'm sure. Oh, yes. <laughs> Um, no, just uh, it was one about um, when you mentioned about Lottie Reisenstein and mm. now suddenly finding yes. someone that knows something about it, which is very exciting for a researcher. Yes. And how, how important it is to engage with families. I've done that myself in my research. Yeah, and I think that was the very first point I made, that it is these personal connect connections that are so important. And I think we're also at a tipping point, particularly with the, the Hitler emigres, because if you think of the age of their children, and in Lottie's case, the age of her nephew, and this is what we find frequently, these individuals suddenly find that they are at a point in life where they have an archive, they have huge amounts of artworks, and they're not sure what to do. So we're getting, I think, probably more and more inquiries along that line about what are we going to do with all this material? And so I think Ben Uri and other institutions will, you know, will be benefiting from this, um, you know, outpouring of legacy of archives. And as you say, for, for us as researchers, it's just fantastic. And, you know, the fact we didn't have a photo of Lottie, she's been in the collection, you know, for however many years, and now we know what she looks like. And that changes, I think, your relationship with her in, in a very kind of profound way. Um, so, yes, very mm -hmm. much looking forward to continuing that conversation with her nephew and particularly discovering more about her design career, which has been completely forgotten. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much again to Rachel and Sarah, and uh, tune in next uh, week. Yeah, uh, where I will be talking actually yeah. um, with John um, King from the National Gallery next Wednesday at six thirty. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.